urban study and planning uh, department. Um, this presentation today is, uh, is, is concise, but actually it's very rich. The word itself is a challenge to me to pronounce, but let's see how it goes. The ideology. Please welcome Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just first want to take a minute to uh, thank the Humanity Center and the Board of Advisors, uh, certainly Miss Jennifer Leonard, who I thought I saw earlier, uh, for waiting until yesterday for me to send the presentation in. Uh, after tweaking it, the reason I took so long is I wanted to want to buy a class first and get their feedback, and I think it was a, a good decision. Uh, but before I begin, uh, in keeping with uh, Dean Raskin's uh, brutal honesty. My tie was designed by the Clinton Foundation and also made in Southeast Asia. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, so, so it's a draw. It's a draw. I think so. I think you're right. There's ideological balance in the room. Um, so my name is Jeff Horner, as uh, Professor Ferrer has just uh, introduced uh, me. So I want to begin, my, my whole backstory to this is to, uh, first of all, uh, explain that I try to impart upon my students the influence of Jeffersonian democracy. Now, many of you in the room are familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't uh, political science students, uh, you'll, uh, you may or may not be aware that Thomas Jefferson gets a lot of blame for urban sprawl in 2016, or at least people like me assign him a lot of blame. But this goes back to Thomas Jefferson's ideology, an ideology of the common man uh, through land ownership in this famous, uh, this famous excerpt of a letter he had written to James Madison. And what also sprung from this, in addition to the preservation of, uh, of, of land ownership for the common man, was also this notion of small governance. That is, that the best way to perhaps, uh, the best tonic against a uh, an ideology of, corpor of corporations and money and so forth would be to uh, uh, distribute government on as small of a basis as possible. And so what this has given us uh, 200, uh, 200 some odd years later are 90,000 units of government in the United States, 90,000 local units of government. This would include uh, certainly cities, uh, townships, counties, local authorities, school districts. And uh, no, other, no other developed nation on Earth even comes close to the raw numbers of government, uh, uh, let alone the, the per capita basis of government. And so I argue that Jeffersonian policies, uh, before I get to that argument, I want to share the, the one image I have for you today. I'm watching some very excellent PowerPoint presentations. You've probably gathered already that PowerPoint is not my strong suit. Uh, but a nice image I think uh, I can share with you is this um, image of the United States, of course, and the prevalence of local government all throughout the United States. And as I'd like to point out to my students, you'll notice this almost this, well, I have a pointer on here. You'll notice this big difference. Is it, I pushed the middle of this, Jennifer? Big difference along the Ohio River there, just south of Ohio and Indiana, between the prevalence of local government. And you'll also know if you recall your Jeffersonian lessons that the Great Lake states were, in Jefferson's day, referred to as the Northwest Territories. These were the areas that he had a very large influence in, in terms of setting up the county and township government, which gave rise to numerous local units of government. Now, uh, you can also see California, one of the more progressive states, or one of our states that has a very strong progressive tradition, also has a high per capita uh, instance of local units of government. So over 90,000 just on a local level in, in, uh, in our country, which is really remarkable. So um, Jeffersonian ideal regarding small population, diffuse local governance has generally worked well for businesses during periods of suburban growth, which I'll roughly sketch out as being between World War II and 2000. We had tremendous growth during this time. This is when we had uh, uh, manufacturers and auto companies with effectively no worldwide competition for exports. And cities, these small units, these small and perhaps inefficient uh, local units of government were still able to flourish. And then you started seeing as we approached the year 2000, again, this is just an arbitrary cutoff 
on my, on my part. We started seeing a number of these local units of government beginning to fail. That is, they would either come under uh, uh, financial uh, receivership that I know our, 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 uh, our keynote speaker of later today is going to be talking about. Uh, and in fact, in Michigan, that happened as early as 1988 with the, uh, the city of River Rouge. So you started to see these small units of government, these Jeffersonian ideal unit, ideals, units of government, uh, start to falter, start to run out of money for whatever reason. And then states would then have to begin to, to set up uh, financial oversight plans for these cities and uh, ultimately leading to bankruptcy in many cases and, uh, you know, financial managers. Um, however, there's an interesting thing that I think has developed in the past few years is that we started coming out of what was called the Great Recession in 2009. And this failure of cities has continued the pace. That is, we've had more instances, or you know, more instances during a period of recovery of cities going under, or of cities coming under financial management. And this is, to me, is counterintuitive uh, insofar as this is supposed to be a recovery. Now, I'm glossing over a lot of reasons for this, because they're not really consistent with what I want to talk about today. But a lot of the reasons, are, of course, are the uh, the limitations on uh, local units of government to even raise money across the board. And certainly in the state of Michigan, there are enormous limitations on local units of government to raise money. And again, I don't want to go into them uh, right now because that's a completely separate uh, policy discussion. So what we're looking at is this, what I refer to as slack 21st century growth in urbanized areas has sort of maybe opened up an opportunity for uh, business and governance to come in and uh, perhaps begin this notion or uh, uh, begin a process of what I'm referring to as divide ideology. That is, um, uh, to offer initiatives that run uh, counter, to, to offer statewide or higher governmentally located initiatives to counter local initiatives. Then, again, leading to this ideology of, divis of divisiveness or divide ideology, as I call it, resulting in limited local governance or limited local powers for self agents. So uh, I think what inspired me to start thinking about these ideas and uh, maybe think about uh, going with a larger manuscript on this is the work, uh, I think, the very famous and important work of Logan and uh, Malish, I can never pronounce his name right, uh, who, did say, who wrote, a, a, I think, an important book in 1987 um, called The uh, Urban Fortunes, The Political Economy of Place where they argued, among several other, I think, important arguments, that the increasing influence of national and multinational corporations and government on local decision-making, local decision-making with diminishing local self-determination. I highly recommend this book. It's been very influential in my thinking about cities. So, how do we define things? As academics, how do I define divine ideology? For the purposes of this discussion, I define it with really having two dimensions. Diffuse one size of one size fits all policy initiatives that better serve the non localized business community than local community wants and needs. Now, this is basically what Logan and Meloche argue in, their, in the relevant chapter of their work that I just cited. And then, second, the targeted policy initiatives, this second dimension, is really what I think is, is, is the novel part of the ideology that targeted policy initiatives seeking to quash and dilute existing or incipient local pol policies or politics. Now, you're probably thinking, there are so many examples of this, what's he going to talk about here? Just know that with the examples I'm about to provide, that this is just tip of the iceberg stuff. I just wanted to give a brief presentation today uh, and maybe stimulate discussion. But here are some of my examples of the first dimension of the ideology. I suggest that one of the first uh, examples is the 2004 uh, anti-gambling anti forces were able to put on a ballot initiative in the state of Michigan, statewide voter approval for local gambling initiatives. Now, I'm not making any basis in judgment as to the morality of gambling. I think it, uh, I think it reinforces a, a very bad set of morals. But nonetheless, this was really closing the barn door after the animals had gotten out. Uh, insofar as a local unit of government, perhaps one that is being starved of resources by the state, is now has to ask on a statewide basis people that would not be affected by the gambling at a local level uh, for, for permission to approve um, casino licenses or any form of gambling licenses. Just to sort of finish the point, uh, 
the example A here had to do with local racetracks. The, the, the racetrack industry in Michigan was really doing poorly. And so how racetracks have been rescued throughout the rest of the country has been to bring in, to bring in more forms of machine-based gambling. So as you can keep the, uh, the, the, the racetracks open that way. Uh, and then next, I want to talk about community benefits agreements, which are fairly recent. They've been around for a long time, but the city of Detroit right now is, uh, or city council has actually approved a set of community benefits agreements that basically say this. If a developer wants to build something and it has a large enough impact on the local community, then therefore that developer has to put up additional resources that would benefit the community. And so this has come up in the context of there's a very large new bridge that's being built uh, down river, and the community is going to be heavily impacted by that. And there's, as you can well imagine, there's been tremendous pushback by the development community against these community benefit agreements. And so much so that in many states, there have been uh, statutes passed that prevent a community benefit agreement from being passed at all. So you're seeing a lot of local legislation emanating from the state level and telling local units of government what they can't do. And this is happening time and time again. And then um, my third example, and this was, this was not as relevant as it was a few months ago, but a few months ago it looked as if there were going to be, that Michigan voters were going to be voting on two separate marijuana legalization ballot initiatives. One of which I'll refer to here for the sake of brevity as the grassroots ballot initiative. That is, this was, I think it was structured as to be an extension of the present medical marijuana dispensaries, and this was more so-called grassroots legislation, or a, a, a grassroots ballot initiative, rather, that uh, would have benefited local, uh, local businesses. And, of course, there was a competing ballot initiative that magically came along that was the business side of, of this. And the business side said, well, we don't want to have people selling dope down in our drugstores. We, we want to regulate it. We've got to keep it safe. This is a controlled substance. And by the way, it's going to be controlled by only two or three families in Michigan, just as is booze and wine and everything else. So this was, uh, this was the, the, the business um, uh, approach to try to quash a local, really what was a, a, a local uh, thing, the, the business community came in and wanted to put their own second confusing ballot question on the November 8th ballot. So that the average voter who's, 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 uh, you know, who's voting is going to say, well, what's the difference between these two? Or, yeah, maybe I'll vote for the one that says that we're going to strictly regulate this, when it was really uh, towards the, uh, the, the aims or the ends of what the business community wanted. Um, and again, this isn't as relevant now because the the, 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 the grassroots um, ballot initiative was taken off of the ballot for lack of lack of signatures or something. There was some legal issue that kept it off the ballot, so uh, there won't be any any marijuana legalization in Michigan anytime soon. But it was very clear that this was this was maybe a uh, uh, you know a usurpation uh, usurpation of uh, of local um, control. And then for maybe the no, the more novel dimension of the ideology, this is that is targeted policy initiative seeking to squash and dilute existing policies. Uh, I like to talk about the role of gerrymandering. We talk about this a lot in politics, and this is oftentimes the big, the big boogeyman when we talk about our divided national politics right now. Um, and I argue that gerrymandering has gotten worse in the past few years. That has now turned into gerrymandering. And so that's my maybe not so clever play on the fact that the districts no longer represent sal salamanders as they did 200 years ago, uh, but maybe now represent worms where they're even smaller and skinnier. So uh, this is, I think, this is also a usurpation of local control insofar as to even call these jerry worms or these gerrymandered districts as districts at all is a big misnomer. When we think of districts, as I tell my students, when we think of an urban district or a city district, this is a no. This is a place that people gravitate to. It's identifiable. Political districts are not that at all. There is no, there is no requirement for, for compactness with any of these districts. And so now, um, these districts, and maybe this is stating the obvious, these are all about political speeds. Straight ticket voting. You 
here in Michigan, for those of you who uh, maybe aren't familiar, there was a, the, uh, a large fight that was led by the Michigan Attorney General to, uh, to get rid of straight ticket voting in Michigan. Michigan had passed a law that was recently overturned by a judge uh, about a month ago that will allow a, uh, you know, so inclined voters to vote straight ticket come November 8th. But what's interesting about this is that straight ticket voting is illegal, or it's not allowed, in up uh, into 40 different states. And so straight ticket voting also, I think, is, a, is an attack on, uh, on local control, on, on local determination, on local self-determination. And then uh, the Michigan legislature used some appropriations to prevent local or statewide ballot initiatives. That is, the new game in town, at least with the Michigan legislature, is to make a law uh, unassailable by a ballot initiative by just attaching a small amount of money to it. Because any appropriations bill in the state of Michigan, and this is a constitutional requirement, any appropriations bill uh, that is, is just that, is unassailable by uh, any sort of ability of the voter to turn it over. So this is an enormous issue. Again, I'm just giving you a few examples here. I was hoping that this talk might generate some discussion. Uh, but there are a number of examples. I haven't even gone into schools. I haven't even gone into the loss of, of, of funding from, uh, from revenue sharing in the state of Michigan. So this is, uh, uh, there are a number of, of, of you know, examples. So let me just conclude that pointing out that Jeffersonian ideals, this notion that uh, divided government, small divided government, ownership in land and so forth, is something that is maybe coming to a close now. This is something that Logan and Meloche picked out 30 years ago, but is, is slowing down and coming to a close, and that business and uh, competition uh, among out-of-state businesses or national businesses that don't have any sort of local, local context, local investment, uh, is, is increasingly diminishing the power of local units of government. Okay. And he, he told me, he said, look, 
You can't even use the word urban in my own Democratic caucus. That's right. You can't even use the word urban here. It will go nowhere. Yeah. So uh, I, I didn't want to get this into a partisan battle. I wanted to talk more about the loss of autonomy at the local level. Uh, it's rhetorically smart in Michigan because the racism is so pervasive, pervasive yeah, yeah, yeah. in a way that even liberal, that little, you know, liberals are right. racist. Absolutely. And so, uh, so Absolutely. you have to, uh, so phrasing it, I sometimes do what you're doing, uh, and I get criticized, you know, you start out with Jefferson, who also raced, yeah. right. uh, but, uh, but Absolutely. so you're sort of using the white ideals against whites, you're saying, yes. you're saying, actually what you're doing is, uh, excuse me, is there room for more questions? Sorry, sorry. I mean, I'm sorry. sorry. You're yeah. dominating sorry. the conversation. Totally, sorry. Okay, please. Yeah, I had, I had a question. Uh, sure. You described the method and the structure of operation and the effect. Who is doing this? What is their ideology and what are their ends? Their, their ideology is divide ideology. And their that ideology doesn't... is to really separate these local units of government and to sell them, to tell them through the passage of policy and the diminution of local agency that what's going on locally doesn't matter here and that we're going to have our way. So it's an ideology of divide ideology. But, but why do they have that ideology, and who are they? Uh, who, they who? are the business community. Okay, they so have that for profit motives. OK, so the, what, you're, what you're saying is the operation is the business community has taken over the Michigan legislature. Isn't that and, obvious? And it's putting forward, well, I, I, I mean, you're not making the argument. You're just I, made, I use the word business in my, in my definition. Uh, what, what do they want? I mean, what, what is it that they want? I mean, what, what, do they, what do they achieve by taking away local control when they could just as easily co-opt local governments? And they have, like Royal Oak, like uh, Detroit. I mean, you know, the business community is all over the place. It's not using, there's, a, there's, a, there's something more going on besides business wanting to tell local communities that they can't pass legislation. Yeah, there is more going on. And this is the behind the scenes machinations of multinational corporations and statewide corporations that are quite effective at changing zoning laws so that they can build bigger and bigger houses in your city, in your popular city. Uh, and again, not to be flippant, but this all comes back to money. And this all comes back and to power. money that, that uh, power certainly, but uh, this, this is what this comes back to. And local communities, local units are increasingly losing agency with the help from state government who is of course on the side the Michigan Chamber of Commerce runs Michigan yeah. I'll say it <laughs> uh, and they're on the side the Michigan Chamber of Commerce has all the, the the full faith and support and credit of the current iteration of the Michigan legislature but that's not to say that this is a new thing this went on all throughout the 90s throughout the grand home years uh, and, and that's it so uh, again this is probably not what I'm not drilling down farther for you, I'm guessing, but no, that that's the point. And okay, go ahead. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. In fact, yes. these, these local governments. This, um, what, what are they? How are they responding? Are they, are they doing away with local governments? First part. Second part. Property taxes. If local governments are are collecting these property taxes yes. and being disempowered, like where's all this municipal money that? What's happening with that? Let me take your question backwards, but I want to tell you now, I'm going to forget your first question by the time I answer your second one. Local units of government are increasingly dependent upon non-property tax money. That is, what I like to tell my students is that in 1960, the city of Detroit enjoyed about 80% of their locally drawn revenues came from property taxes. By 2008, 2009, the number was down to 17%. So there's other sources of taxation that they have to benefit from, uh, and uh, also too this notion of uh, of state re of statewide revenue share that has gone down also. So I think this may get to what you're asking in the first part of your question that local units of government are increasingly at the mercy or at the will of the state legislature, who is free to break promises that were made in the late 1990s when the whole revenue sharing scheme was going to make everybody happy and this. Is going to make this is all going to be done on a population basis instead of a, a tax rate basis. Again, I'm getting down to some policies here, but I think what's happening is the state is either.
trying to completely diminish local uh, property uh, or local, local units of government uh, by starving them with the power of the purse, uh, and or trying to get them to merge into other more efficient units of government. And kind of another generic thing I like to tell my students is that the state wants to treat all of the, the emergency financial managers and the, the failures of, uh, of cities financially. The state treats that purely as a public administration problem. And I like to call it a public policy problem because we have this constant, you know, this constant push out and all the urban sprawl arguments that, that uh, I'm sure many of you heard over and over. But what this is doing at the local level is it's setting up this new form of ideology, this divide ideology, that is really diminishing powers of local units of government. Aside from the financial questions that you're even, that you're raising. Mark. Uh, Jeff, on, on a couple of smaller pieces here that I think you, if you deleted a couple of things that don't seem to be relevant as, okay. as infringements on local authority, like straight ticket voting, is it, it and and voting rights that's about individual rights right and it is it, it's never been under the purview of local well, government. Yes, government right the the second thing is gerrymandering while it influences things i it's not at all clear to me that it's it is about the deprivation of local government authority where I, I would move on to do is one is the Headley Amendment and the way in which it res has restricted the ability of local governments right. to raise adequate funds. So my water bill was the most ridiculous thing yeah. I've ever seen last time because everything was shunted into fees. But <coughs> the other piece that it, it, it seems to be that's missing is the consequences of term limits in the legislature, which undermines issues of local responsibility of representatives and yep. increases their dependence on experts because there are no internal experts within the legislature. So it's understandable yep. that lobbyists who have knowledge yep. are, end up with a lot more influence. I completely agree with you on term limits. And I would also add that gerrymandering is relevant for the reasons you, that you're citing for term limits. Because there used to be a time when districts had centers. And these districts were more compact. And the, 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 the representative from these districts would typically know people. And th there was a communal aspect to pre-gerrymandering days. I mean, there absolutely was. So it, it's more of a stretch than I think your point. But uh, I think gerrymandering is really important for local self-determination. But thank you. Thank you for the suggestions. It's, uh, thank you for attending, too, and giving me feedback. Thank you, Samuel.